Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome this afternoon our speaker, Dr. Tong Wang. Um, Dr. Wang is an assistant professor in the Department of Business Analytics at the University of Iowa. She received her MS and PhD in computer science from MIT and her BS from Beijing University of Posts and Telecommunication. Her research focuses on machine learning, data mining, and data-driven decision-making with applications to healthcare and business. Her previous research on crime data mining has won awards, been reported widely in the media, and has been implemented by the New York Police Department. Dr. Wang also develops interpretable and hybrid machine learning models, which have also earned recognition and awards. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wang. Uh, the format our, of our Jones seminar will be as usual. So the speaker will present and then we will have an open Q&A period at the end of the this, this seminar. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. It's been a long time since I talked to new people about my research. So I really appreciate uh, the opportunity here to give this talk. Um, my name is Tong Wang. I'm currently assistant professor at the University of Iowa. Now in today's talk, I'm going to talk about one of my um, most recent projects on hybrid machine learning, when we build an interpretable model to collaborate with an existing black box model. So before I go on, I want to give some context of my um, research projects. My, my research interests focus on interpretable machine learning and then the, the, its applications. Uh, within this category of interpretable machine learning, I De develop models that are inherently interpretable, such as rule-based models or interpretable deep learning models, which involves reinventing the structure of deep learning such that the model itself is understandable to humans without any technical background. Uh, in addition to that, I also work on hybrid models where we assume you have a pre-existing black box model and I want to build an interpretable collaborator such that some of your work uh, can be delegated to the interpretable model and increasing transparency in the decision-making process. And um, for the same context, we can replace a black box machine learning model as a human decision-maker. So how can we build a model to assist human decision-making? And then for the application, uh, I'm currently in the business school in uh, UI, so I am particularly interested in business problems such as uh, predicting the credit risk and uh, we entered the FICO uh, explainable machine learning challenge and we won a reward by building a model that is as an interpretable model that is as accurate as any black box model to predict whether this uh, customer would default on the payment and then I were also working work on other related business problems like uh, allocating the campaign budget and planning different events for shopping malls in, in order to increase the, the daily customer traffic. Um, I'm also generally interested in machine learning for social goods, such as healthcare and uh, the crime pattern detection, which is one of my previous works. And this one is in collaboration with the Cambridge Police Department. And we develop model to help them identify which crimes are committed by the same criminal, so which basically is crime series. And uh, the idea of this work has been implemented in the software that has been operating live in New York City since 2019. Okay, anyway, to summarize, my, my uh, research interest is to develop interpretable, understandable, accountable machine learning models and use that to solve real world problems. In today's uh, talk, I will focus on talking about hybrid models. Okay, so first of all, why do we need interpretability of machine learning and what is interpretable model? So I will begin by talking about what, why, and how do we do interpretable machine learning. So interpretability is the ability to explain or to present a model in understandable terms to human. Now this human could be a model designer who needs to debug the model, diagnose the model, and try to think of ways to improve the model. It also refers to a, a user or uh, people which the decisions are made on. For example, if you are a customer, you apply for a loan, 
and then the machine learning model decides to reject the application. As a user, as an applicant, you would want to know why I'm rejected. So you desire this interpretability in the decision-making process. So why do we need interpret machine learning? Because we need the accountability from decision makers. We need to be able to justify, especially when the decisions are made on humans, like you're a doctor, you're trying to diagnose this patient. You want to, uh, you need to be able to know why this model says this patient has this disease. And it's also for some ethics issues. You want to guard against certain kind of discrimination. For example, the model might be uh, biased against some certain race or certain gender or certain age group. If you know how the model is derived, you can help prevent such discrimination. And as a model designer, if your model is not doing well, you want to know how can I improve the model, right? If, we, if you want to do that, you, you need to know how the predictions are derived. So there has been a call for the model transparency from the industry and the government. There is a very famous uh, EU GDPR, which is General Data Protection Regular, Regular, Regulation, which uh, protects the right to explanation uh, for every user. So next we'll talk about how do we achieve interpretability in the um, state-of-the-art research. So there are general two, uh, generally two approaches. One approach is uh, assume you have a black box model, then we focus on building black box explainers to explain in the post hoc way or try to approximate in the post hoc way how your black model works. So one of the uh, very first work in this category is called LIME, Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanation. Now this paper was published in 2016. The idea is actually very straightforward. Now let's say you have made a decision on this instance, this red instance, and the prediction is positive. Now you see if you observe the decision boundary, now it's very complicated, but the idea is I can sample around this prediction so I can gather a small set of data points and then I can build a, a interpret model. Now in this case, they build a linear model to locally approximate the decision boundary. And then they say, okay, this linear model locally represents what happens here in the black box. Now, this is the idea of line. Then based on this idea, a lot of work has been proposed. Um, try to approximate or you know, um, shed some light on the local input and also global, global model behavior. This is one of the, the, the one first approach. Now, the second approach is Okay, some people say, okay, let's just totally abandon black box. Let's build models that are inherently interpretable, such that you would not need any black box explainers. For example, linear models, right? They're interpretable, especially if you have very sparse linear models. Or decision trees, or rule-based models, case-based models. These models, inherently, they are understandable. So they don't need any black box explainers. Now, these two are the state-of-the-art two approaches, most popular two approaches, um, but neither of them is perfect. And they both of them have their issues and I'll, I will discuss individually. So for the first one, the black box explainers, they have underwent ex very heated discussion, especially in recent years. The, this, this approach become very controversial for, the, for many reasons. Uh, first of all, um, there, there is low explanation fidelity. So when you want to build a simple model to approximate a black box, the simple models usually cannot represent really exactly what happened. They cannot approximate in the perfect way. So the model prediction does not really agree with the black box, right? There's also inconsistency issue because many types of black box explainers have been created and you will have different explanations for the same model output. So which one are you gonna choose? Now, even you see you use the same explanation method if you tune the parameter, you are likely to get different explanation. So people would not have no idea which one I'm going to adopt for the specific um, input and output pair. And especially recently, people start to shift their attention from building model explainers to you know doing research that attack a explanation. So for example, there is a paper called Fairwash. The idea is Fairwash is um, 
in the original black box model, if you rank the feature importance, now you see gender is ranked very high. So the model, original model is biased, but somehow they construct a model that can approximate um, the output in a very accurate way. Let's say more than 90% of the prediction is actually correct. It's actually the same as a black box. However, the gender, the importance of gender is ranked the least. Well, so if I am the black box explainer, then I provide to a user and say, hey, look at the, the feature importance. Look at how fair my model is because it's simply not using too much of the gender, right? And then it's, this is a very deceptive information because I'm, the model basically is cheating, okay? So this is called a fair wash and there are many follow-up work in this category. So this is the issue with black box explainers. Okay, so what about the second approach, which is to build models that are inherently interpretable so that you would not in need a black box explainer. Those are not perfect either because the interpretability might be too expensive, meaning that when you try to confine the complexity of the model, then sometimes you will lose predicted performance, right? This is uh, very intuitive because if you want to use a very small decision tree, a very sparse linear model, a very small uh, prototypes in the case-based model, then your model cannot handle that much complicated uh, syn uh, synergies or, or correlations in the data set. So therefore, there is a natural trade-off between accuracy and the interpretability. But as a practitioner, you would not know, and you will have a hard time choosing, you know, do I prefer accuracy or do I prefer interpretability? How do I get both, right? So this is a dilemma. Then motivated by these, the, the both um, the approaches of work above, and then I, we propose a new type of model, which is called a some, uh, hybrid machine learning model. Now try to, now the, the idea is that, okay, we don't have to totally rely on the black box model. Even the black box model is most accurate. We hypothesize that there might exist a potentially large subspace in the feature space where the black box model is overkill, such that these instances can be processed by an interpretive model at no or very little cost of accuracy. So this is like saying I'm delegated part of my job to an interpretive model. Well, I'm leaving some of the part where the interpretive model is incapable to the original black box model, such that I uh, create a collaboration between the two. So in this case, I will gain partial transparency, part only partial, right? And at very minimal or even no cost of the accuracy. Now, this is the idea of the hybrid models. Okay, so the decision making process is like this. When you, whenever you have an instance X, I first feed you into the interpretable model and then let the interpretable model decide whether I, if he is capable of making this decision or there's a need to activate the black box, all right? If he is capable, then directly this white eye hat will be produced. Otherwise, he's, he will say, okay, I cannot make a decision, let's get a black box, all right? And then a prediction will be produced from this black box. Now, this decision-making process is actually uh, very similar to some of the decision-making process in the re real world. For example, let's say if you have a, a patient, right? You don't want to always send him to the most experienced or most expensive doctor, right? Because he's already, right, it's very expensive, right? You don't want to directly send him to the attending, but instead you want to send him to an intern or a resident and he'll try to make a diagnose. If he say, okay, I'm very confident you're just having a flu, go back, and uh, take some, some hot water, take some sleep, you'll be fine. And then we can let this, this patient go. Otherwise, if the, this uh, resident say, okay, I'm not very confident, I cannot make a uh, decision, then he, um, he will send this patient to a more experienced, more, uh, uh, more expensive doctor. Right? This is exactly the, how the decision is made in the hybrid decision-making process. Okay. So essentially, we, we, when we say we build an interpretable collaborator, we're trying to um, partition the feature space into two parts. Some part of it giving to, given to the interpretive model and the remaining is left to the black box. 
And here we assume two things about that black box model. It is pre-trained, which means you cannot alter the decision-making process in the black box. The black box remains what it is in the whole time. The second is it is private, which means you have no information about how the prediction is made. You don't even need to know what type of model it is. You don't know whether it's a, a exibus ensemble or neural network or whatever it is. You can consider this a proprietary software or it's just a, literally a black box to us. Okay, given that, how do we build a interpreter model? That's the goal of this, of this work. Okay, let me introduce the, um, the, some of the notation here. Assume we, are, we work with the uh, training data, which is a classification data. Okay, and we have a pre-trained black box model FB. And our framework is agnostic to FB, so we only have the output of FB in the training data. So we denote this output, output as YB hat. Okay, this is the only thing we have. And our goal is to build an interpreter model FI such that FI will collaborate with FB to form a hybrid predictive model. And then we define something, we define the ratio between this DI. DI is the percentage of data that can be processed by FI. Now the ratio of DI uh, to this D is called transparency. The larger the transparency means more data is delegated to the interpreter model, that, that is better, okay? The learning objective considers three things, the overall predictive performance, uh, accuracy, the transparency, and interpretability. Now our goal is to how to build FI such that we maximize all three, the linear combination of the three. Okay, so what kind of interpreted models can be placed into this general framework? Now in this talk, I will talk about two types of models, but more models can fit into the same framework. Um, we can use decision rules, or you can also use linear models. Now, if we use rules, then the decision-making process has this uh, logic. So we find two sets of rules. So the first is a set of positive, a uh, set of rules capturing positive instances, and RI captures negative instances. So we say that if XI satisfies any of the rules in R plus, we predict positive. Otherwise, we check against the negative, uh, negative rules. If you satisfy any of the rules in RI, we predict negative. If you don't satisfy any rules, we say, okay, these simple rules are incapable of making a prediction. Then we predict, you know, we pr output this uh, black box prediction. So here is an example. Uh, this is a very simple example or trained from a heart disease data set. Now, this is to predict whether this patient has uh, heart disease. For the positive rules, we, we find two rules. The first is um, age less than 35 and the maximum heart rate is, is greater than 178. Uh, or this, this feature is greater than 234 and this not equal to three and the number of vessels greater than one. If you satisfy any of the rules, either of the rules, we predict, yes, this patient has heart disease. Otherwise, we check against this feature. If this is satisfied, then we predict no heart disease. Otherwise, we say, okay, we are unable to make a prediction. Then we use black box model. All right, now using these rules, we formulate this learning objective, try to fit that in the objective we devised in the previous slide. So the, for the performance, predictive performance, the loss comes from both the rules and the black box model. Transparency is computed as the support. Support means the coverage of the rules. How many instances um, satisfy the rules, right? The support divided by the D. For model interpretability, here we would desire smaller model. Smaller model means just a few rules, right? If you generate a model with a like, like hundred of rules, then you wouldn't consider this model is interpretable, okay? So, then we combine them to have this, um, this, R, this lambda as the objective function. And our goal is to find this R star that minimizes this. Okay, now that we do, um, we construct a training algorithm to learn the best rules. These training algorithm is very similar to simulated annealing, but we 
customize some of the strategy here to make it adaptable to our context. So we start with the, given the input of a pre-trained black box model, we generate the candidate rules from data D. Candidate rules are rules that have you know, high support and high accuracy in, in the data. These will serve as the sort of promising candidates. So we don't generate rule from scratch. Uh, when we, when later, when we run the algorithm, we'll just search from these candidate rules. Now, usually we generate 10,000 rules for the positive instances and 10,000 rule for the negative instances. All right, and then we go to the main um, algorithm structure. Now, the idea is that each state or each intermediate, intermediate solution represents a hybrid rule set model. And every time we propose a new solution based on the current solution. And then if the solution has achieves better performance or you know, it satisfies this um, with a certain probability, we will accept the proposed solution. And then gradually you will move from the regional solution and converge to the final solution. Now in simulated kneeling, this new solution is proposed by randomly proposing some new new neighbor, right? But if you do that, the computation complexity will be too, too large. So we devise some more intelligent proposing strategy um, by trying to improve one of the three metrics at a time. Either we want to reduce complexity by removing a rule or we increase transparency by adding a rule, or we want to reduce the error, okay? Now this will depend on so which error point we, we draw, and then how we adjust model coverage. So suppose you draw an error here, then you wanted to adjust the positive rules or negative rules, um, such that this instance is covered by the correct rule. If the error point you draw is from here, then you want to add the correct rule to cover, it, cover this instance, instead of handing it over to a black box. And then the, the accepted proposal um, is uh, the proposal model is accepted with certain probability. And here C is uh, this part represents the temperature that it will decrease with time. So at the very beginning, you will be more aggressive in ex, uh, proposing new uh, new solutions. But as the temperature decrease, as you you know for uh, go towards the the final part of the search, you will be more conservative of moving your solution. So there's a still potential issue of computation complexity. So how do we utilize the property of the model to further reduce the complexity? So we can derive um, some bounds. So first of all, we derive, a, there's a lower bound of the support. Lower bound means that um, each rule need to cover a significantly amount of instances. Then if not, then this one, when we, we can prove that if the support is too low, now this rule will never be part of any best model, which means from this candidate rules, we can throw away some of the rules that do not qualify, right? This will help reduce the search space. Now, in addition, we can derive a bound on, uh, on interpretability. We can say an optimal rule set will contain no more than these many rules. So if you see your intermediate solution having too many rules, then you will propose to um, do not add this act, do not propose to adding a rule, right? So similarly, we can also derive a bound on transparency. So it means that um, the rules, the support of the rules it need to cover a significant amount of the data. This, they have to take a, a large amount of the partition of the data. So if they don't, then we would want, not want to re, uh, remove a rule. Instead of we want to um, add a rule to in, increase the coverage. So utilizing this strategy, we can make the, uh, prune out some of the bad search paths. So we'll increase the, the complexity of the search algorithm. All right. All right, then after, you know, long enough iterations. You know, in general, we choose the, the capital T to 500. Usually after 500 iterations, then we'll um, get a very a good enough solution. 
All right, so the summary of this idea is that what we are provided is a pre-trained black box model for which we have the output, the prediction on the training data. And our goal is to input this training data and predict the labels to this training algorithm. And then this training algorithm will find R plus and RI as the interpretable collaborator to, to work together with this YB. All right, okay, so, so let's examine how it performs on some of the data sets. So here, let's just show uh, four very interesting data sets. So for example, this juvenile delinquency, it's a survey taken decades ago. This is a very long data set, but I found this interesting because all the teachers are actually questions from the survey. So they want to predict uh, whether this child will, del uh, will commit delinquency in the future based on his prior exposure to violence. So the so, so survey will ask questions such as, uh, will your friend uh, like hit you or are you ever beaten up by your family or do you ever see your family member taking drugs or, or you know, these style of questions. And the, the feature values will be, they will say yes, no, or do they refuse to answer, okay. And uh, there's another data set. This data set is um, collected by a, a survey. So this is to study whether this customer will respond to a coupon recommended to him while he's driving. So for example, we say, okay, imagine you're driving home and you're driving alone. Uh, the current time is 10 p.m. and it's currently snowy outside. And then we give him his map and say, okay, so you're, you're currently in A and you want to go to B. And now we give you a coupon for coffee. And the coupon, the place is in here in the, the screen place. And then I ask the driver whether you want to accept the coupon. Okay, so this is another data set. All right, now using this data set, we build our model and we also compare with the, the baselines. So we first compare with the black box models and we build random forest ADA boost and extra boost. Uh, these are used as not just baseline, but also the input to the algorithm because later we'll create an interpretive model to collaborate with these baselines. And then interpretive baselines include um, other rule-based models like a decision, uh, like a CARD, C4.5, C5.0, and some more recent ones like a BRS and BRL. All right, so how do we evaluate our model? Now, we don't just want to evaluate the accuracy, right? Because in, if you compare accuracy, it's hard to beat the black box. We may have a chance, but the, that's not the only goal. We only care about the transparency. So we, we built this something we call transparency function efficient frontier, um, where the x-axis is the transparency. Now, really, let me re remind you, transparency means the percentage of data that is sent to the interpreter model to predict. So how much model, how much instances we can take over from the black box model. The, the uh, y-axis is the accuracy. So when transparency is zero, then it becomes, it is reduced to a black box model, right? Everything is sent to the black box. When the transparency is one, it means everything is sent to the interpreter model. So it is reduced to a black, to an interpreter model. So a hybrid model is somewhere in between. And where do you want to land depends on the user's preference, right? So user can say, okay, I can tolerate at most this much error from the black box. And then we can move the point here, right? To this gray box. Okay, let's see the transparency uh, reflection frontier for the data sets. These are the four data sets. Now this column, they are the, the baselines. Now you see that all the baselines have some gap compared to the black box models, right? So, so if we don't use a hybrid model, you will either choose between, you know, the black box here with zero uh, interpretability at all, or you would try to uh, choose this interpreted models, but with the some loss in the accuracy. Now, for our hybrid models, you now the each curve is generated by tuning the different parameters so we can locate at different places. Now you see that at the very beginning, if you push for transparency, you almost do not lose too much accuracy, right? So this can be explained by, you know, at the very beginning, when you push for transparency, 
some of the easy instances that are far away from the decision boundary will be sent to the interpreter model. So you see that all these easy instances, you don't lose interpretability, sorry, you don't lose accuracy. But once you pass certain threshold, and this threshold is different for different data sets, once you pass that and you still push for, um, for, for transparency, then you will see a very significant loss of, of accuracy, right? This is what we observe for the efficient frontier. And it's the, the, this it seems, the pattern seems very similar across different data sets. So in reality, in practice, we can actually generate this curve and then give this to some user and then ask him to choose, where do you want to land? Where, what is the optimal operating point for you? All right, so let's see an example here. This is the juvenile data set, right? This is the model with only two rules. Now, recall that this one to predict whether this, this child or this juvenile would, would commit delinquency. So the positive rule says, okay, if, so for this question, has anyone including a family member ever attacked you with gun, knife, or some other weapon? And he says, yes. And then we ask, has anyone including family member ever threatened you with gun or knife? Um, it's, he says, yes. And also has your friends ever purposely damage or destroyed property? And, and he also says, yes. If he says three yeses, then we predict, yes, he will commit delinquency. You know, out of so many questions, the model just pick three questions and say, okay, we're confident that this person will commit delinquency. Otherwise, we ask them three other questions, including, you know, has, has your family physically attacked you? And he did not say yes. And we ask, has your friends ever sold hard drugs, and et cetera, and did not say yes, and so on, okay? And this person satisfy this, and we say, okay, he will not commit delinquency. So otherwise, if they do not satisfy either of the questions here, then we say, okay, we will need a black box model to predict. Right, this is the, the example on juvenile data set. Okay, so this is the idea of how to uh, plug in decision rules to this hybrid model. We can also plug in linear models. And now we want to extend the idea to multi-class classification. So for a linear model, we, we, we change the decision-making process a little bit. Now that we assume it's a K-class, right? So we devise K different linear agents. Now, every time when there's input X, we let K linear agents to bid for the instance. Each of them will propose a score. Now, if one of the agents beats the, all the other, uh, beats other agents by a significant margin, which is this WKTX minus any of the WJX, and is larger than that by a significant margin theta K, then we say this agent K wins, okay? And then we would classify this instance as class K. Now, if there's no winner, we say that none of the, the agents can classify this instance, then we activate the black box model. Okay, so with this, um, Again, we follow this idea of, you know, predicted performance, transparency, and model interpretability. For the error, to compute the error, then we classify, uh, we, we categorize the data into different sets. Um, this IK plus represents the black box classifies correctly this instance. And minus, it means, IK minus means the black box model misclassifies it. And then based on this, we devise this loss function, right? This phi is some non-increasing convex closed form, a uh, closed loss function. So if you're cl correctly classified by block, black box, so there's only an error if a linear agent other than K wins. So you're claimed by one of the wrong agent. However, if you're misclassified, then there's an error if agent K does not win, right? This is the loss function. And then next we talk about transparency. Transparency means you know, how much data can be claimed by the interpreter model. Now this is determined by theta k, right? So if theta k is small, basically we lower the bar for any agent to win. If theta k is large, then the, any agent k is less likely to 
to, to beat others by such a large margin. So we, we try to minimize the theta k to increase the transparency. Okay, finally, model interpretability. This will be a very standard regularization for linear models. We can do L1 or L2 or a combination of them. Okay, then this is a loss function. And this is a, um, because you know, this is a very standard convex optimization. So we just use the, you know, off the shelf ABG algorithm to, to solve it. Okay, I will not talk too much about this. Now let's see the function, the efficient frontier. Now, compared to rule models, if we use a linear model, you'll see that the, the efficient frontier decreases. It's a, it's a more deeper decrease, right? Compared to rule-based model originally, you can still see some very flat curve. Now, here it's not flat, um, except for this one. So what we, we, we try to explain this, and we think that the reason is for rule-based models. Now, each rule is like a hypercube. It's more flexible to cover certain places in the in the feature space. But for linear model, it's much harder because you have to cover the entire half space, half space. So that's why it's not as flexible as a you know, as a rule-based models. So the efficient frontier does not, is not as good as the rule-based models. Now let's see a, a, a example on the medical data set. Now on this data set, we want to classify and make diagnosis on children. There are five class labels, no illness, diarrhea, um, and the respiratory infection, fever, and other illness. All the features include, these are the features, the uh, things which months or day did the child start to eat vegetables, and things which months did the child start to eat solid food or, or semi-solid food, and so on. All right, so the pre-trained random forest is 66% accuracy, right? It's not very high because this problem is actually very difficult to classify even for a black box model. And then we combine, we build a interpretable collaborator with this random forest. And this one can achieve 66.4 accuracy. So it doesn't lose accuracy. And it's, it gains transparency at 77.7%. .7%. So this amount of data can be classified by this very simple linear model, right? Five agent. And these are the features. So we consider this interpretable is because now you can clearly know how each agent derived its score, right? By plugging in this, these feature instances, uh, feature values into each linear model and to get the score. So, and you will also know in which feature plays a key role in each category. For example, this one, acute, uh, respiratory infection. Now we know that two features are most important. They see um, when, since when does the child start to take animal milk? And also this feature is since when does the child start to eat semi-solid food? Okay. And then we get the score and then because the score F3 is significantly larger than the others. Um, so we predict this child has this disease. All right, this is the idea of um, linear hybrid model. And now we compare it with the other models and we want to compare with just not only the accuracy but also uh, the complexity. Here we evaluate the, uh, represent the complexity by the number of uh, non-zero terms. So here is a non uh, 26 non-zero coefficients. And then for decision trees, we use the number of nodes, right? For card is 167, C4 4.5 is 91, and C5.0 is 132. They're very complicated, a lot of terms, but for us, it only uses 26 features. Okay. All right, so, so far we talked about, you know, how we can plug in this uh, decision rules or linear models into this hyper decision-making format. Um, but this framework can be adaptable for other models. For example, you can use GAN, generalized additive model, or generalized linear model, right? And this will be very similar to the linear model we talk about. You can also plug in decision trees. Now, the idea would be you know, something like if you build a decision tree, you don't want to um, label every leaf. Instead, you'll say, okay, some of the leaves I'm not so sure, so let, let this, you know, black box to make a 
decision. Or you can use case-based models. Case-based model means that when you have a new, in I pre-select, let's say 20 prototypes from the data. So whenever there's a new instance, I compare this new instance with a prototype to see if he's significantly similar to one of them, and then use the prototype um, label as the prediction. Now here we can do the same, same thing. Um, to fit into the hybrid framework, we say that when you have a new instance, we compare with each of the prototype only when you are significantly similar, like bar, by certain margin, then we say, okay, you can be claimed by the prototype. Otherwise, you're not that similar to the prototype. So we say, okay, you cannot be classified well. So let me send you to the black box model. Right, so this is the idea. Okay, so there are some follow-up work for this hybrid decision-making process. So far, we have been talking about using the, considering the black box model as a, as a machine learning model, which means you have like infinite access to the model, right? You can generate some random instances fitting to the model. The model will give you prediction. But what if this model is, let's say, a human decision-maker? For human decision-maker, you don't have limited, unlimited access. Right? You cannot actively involve him in the training data, or you may not have enough true labels from this person. All right. So how do we build a, uh, a collaborator to collaborate this human? Now, all, not only for the accuracy, actually in human decision-making, a more an urgent problem to address or more important problem to address is fairness. The human often have you know, uh, you know, implicit, um, uncontrollable bias towards certain group of people. So, but we don't want to totally replace him because, for example, this guy is a, is a judge. You cannot replace a judge on every case. That's impossible. But if we can identify, you know, on a small subset of data, uh, this, this person always biased against, then we can build some something like a screening rule. And before that, people can make some decision. So when there's uh, two different instances, two offenders come in, we check him against this model, interpretable collaborator, and say, if you satisfy this rule, then we say, okay, we don't let the judge decide. I'll directly give you prediction. Otherwise, we say, okay, you're fine. This judge doesn't make a, doesn't, he's not biased against you. So, okay, go ahead to let him decide, you know. So this still follows the uh, hybrid decision-making framework. All right, so I have three minutes to conclude. I'm right on time, okay. So in this talk, I, um, describe a general framework for the collaboration between an interpreter model and a black box model. Now, the black box model can, could be black box machine learning model, and in the follow-up work, we can also extend it to any human being where it still satisfy two constraints. It is pre-trained, so you cannot alter the decision-making process, and also it's private. You don't know how the decision is derived. Uh, the benefit of hybrid model is it brings together the strengths of the interpreter model. So it gives you understandability on a potentially large subset of data. And also it has the strengths of black box model being very accurate and provide more choices for users for model selection. So as a practitioner, you can choose the best operating point based on your task specific, domain specific need for interpretability, transparency, and model performance. Another benefit of this is the entire training process is uh, agnostic, model agnostic, which means when I build a collaborator to collaborate with you, I don't need to know how you make decision. You may use some um, confidential feature even that I don't, I don't have, but that's okay. All I need is your prediction on the instances. That is enough for me to devise such a, a good enough collaborator. Okay, and, and I, I think this uh, framework is a, makes it possible you know, for many follow-up work in, in the same category. All right, with that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm be happy to, to take questions. Thank you.